Good morning. This is going to be an interesting conversation, actually more of a monologue since I'm speaking one way unless you join me and end up having this conversation with me. This is about misrepresenting and how some things are taken out of context. So if you've ever gotten into the position where you have taken something out of context, misread something that was said to you, that was heard, or in some way things got construed to be something more than it is, then stay with me because I don't think I'm alone. So good morning, Michael, Josh, Beverly. I'm happy you're here. And if you'd like to share this with others, it'll be an interesting conversation. One of the things that ended up spurring up this conversation was because recently one of my mentors and friends, Tony Robbins, was disparaged through BuzzFeed. And BuzzFeed is a publication where they put out information, not always the truth, but take things out of context. And they said they spent a year and a half um, doing this article, and it turned out to be more of a disgruntled employee's um, information that they decided to put out there. And they interviewed other people and literally took them out of context. And there are videos all over the internet now from those people saying that's not what was said, um, that Tony was an amazing help to them and they helped he helped him see things in a different way. But unfortunately, it was taken out of context. And it's interesting to see that a man who's helped over 50, 000, 50 million people, have had over, I think it's four or five million people at his live events, that has changed so many people's lives just that somebody decides it's a time to take them down. And because it's kind of the words they were using. So I say this because it's not about Tony Robbins right now. This conversation is about you. It's about me. It's about how things are taken out of context and how people misread information and they decide to make it true. So I always found it very fascinating where we can take something and twist it. We can be brought up in the same home with other people and other siblings and we'll hear things differently. We're in the same room hearing the same exact message, but we're going to hear it differently. Understand that the way we take information is very unique. And I'm going to explain it to you that if you do not know how we decipher information, I've been studying neuroscience and human psychology for 25 years. I'm fascinated by it. Know that every single thing you do comes in as a information, but it comes in as 4,000 bits of information. You could only take in four at a time. So here's what you do. You take it all in. And then at one point when you want to disseminate it and share it with somebody else, you start generalizing the information because there's no way you can give full detail of what really happened in that moment. Unless you to recount the moment verbatim, that one moment may take hours and hours and hours to explain because things that we aren't taking into account happen to be like the temperature in the room. I can tell you about an experience I had going to an event and how it was, and it was amazing, it was a lot of energy, and it was awesome, so many people, but I might not have told you about how the, the seat felt under my buns. I might not have told you about the temperature in the room or the, the noise that was coming from different areas that I didn't quite know what it was, but I was so busy paying attention to what was in front of me. I might not be able to give you all the people and the characters that were in the room and how it made me feel specifically because I couldn't even account for it. There's generalizations in how we take in information. And then there's distortions because we take it in and in order for us to be able to bring it back, we're gonna distort it and make it in a different form that's deliverable to somebody else to change it. And then there's deletions. And the deletions could be the temperature in the room, the sounds, the feelings, all the other stuff. Now, none of this is intentional. This is called a meta model, and it's from Milton Erickson. Um, and what it is, is it's how we take information in. So somebody goes ahead and tells you the story and gives you all these details and you think, I got the whole story. I'm gonna tell you, you never, ever, ever, ever get the, two the whole story. And you've heard the expression that there's two sides to every story. Well, there's more than two sides to every story. There's more than three sides to every story. That story will change over time of telling it. It will get nuances that you never heard before. It will change over the years. It will change over the new perception of what reality Reality is for you when you tell the story it may be told a different way and I'll give you an example so I used to tell stories about my dad my dad just passed away in January and I love the my dad and I still love my dad and um, for years I told these awful stories about my dad because he wasn't always very nice he had a nickname for me I preferred he didn't have which was a H meant asshole and in private, it was asshole. In public, it was AH. And I thought princess would have been so much better. 
Well, I kept telling this story about this AH story about how bad my dad was, but what I failed to tell anybody, what I deleted from all the other stories was how he was there every single day of my life, how he wanted to protect me, how if anybody hurt me, he was going to hurt them, how he totally, totally was was the you know the protector and the guardian of his children of how he always showed up we were first anywhere he went he took us with him how he totally wanted us to be part of his life like i failed to tell any of those stories because i deleted and distorted and generalized the information only to the point of view that i wanted it's our frame of reference and how we take things in and then how we put it out again and I think that with what I'm seeing in the news right now, not just with Tony Robbins, but with everybody, with media and how they get viewership and how they get the eyes on this stuff and have these glorified titles to make you come in and listen more, it just makes me see how much is not just the media, but we're doing it ourselves. You know, Think about the last time you were in a conversation with somebody in the family and they looked at you the wrong way. Now, I can't be the only one that thinks they're looking at me the wrong way. They look at you the wrong way and all of a sudden you get like a little upset and you're angry and you say, oh my God, I can't believe they did that. But you have no idea what they were thinking, but you interpreted it as something about you. And here's the challenge with that. I used to do that with my husband. Yardley is amazing. I call him handsome to you, he's Yardley. Yardley would go into these moments where he's thinking and I didn't know it was a thinking moment. And all of a sudden I'd say something to him and he'd give me a look like, and I didn't understand what that was. I'm like, why, why is he doing that? Like, what did I say to deserve that kind of response? And then when I'd end up saying something to him later, I'm like, handsome, what was that about? He goes, what was what about? I go, what was that face? He goes, what face? I said, well, you made this face when I asked you this question. He said, I didn't make a face to you. I just asked. I just was thinking of something and it, that's what I was thinking. So if instead I interpreted it as the face, which wasn't even the face. It was just him thinking and processing information, but I decided to make it about me. Well, I think this is so, so happy. Yes, Anna, it does happen all the time. It's so, so common and we don't actually give it any merit. Instead, we give things meaning that don't actually have a meaning that is correct. It's the meaning you gave it. And Viktor Frankl wrote a book, Man's Search for Meaning. And if you haven't read it, it's one of my favorite books. He actually was in the Holocaust. He talks about how people went through this whole experience. Some people didn't make it out, obviously. They were burned in the ovens. And he said he had to find a meaning for why they were there. And he talks about a woman who played beautiful piano and the generals um, were actually forcing her to play for them. And she didn't want to, but she also knew that she didn't, they'd kill her or kill her son. And they kept her and her son alive because she played. And also when she played, they'd give an extra piece of bread, which she can give her son. And where somebody else would have given it a different meaning, she would go off and play for them. And she'd imagine herself in the gardens and, and, and in a nice place where she can actually enjoy being there. And then she made it where it was okay because her doing that made it so she can feed her son and they can live and they can get through that. Well, Viktor Frankl ended up writing Logotherapy and it's talk therapy. It's about, and it was really about the meaning we give anything. And with anything else, there are people who just couldn't even find a reason to survive and live and were giving up. So they gave it a meaning of dying and they didn't even try. Others that saw themselves when they'd get out and remembered their family and their loved ones and did all the other stuff so that they can, they can persevere through the hardest times and be able to do something about it. Well, if everything is the meaning we give it, is it also possible that if we take things out of context, we can be giving it correct meaning or wrong meaning or meanings that don't serve us? Forget about correct or right or wrong. Let's talk about meanings that don't serve you. So how many times are situations happening where you give it a meaning that doesn't serve you? And I know in the past, I used to do that and I found it didn't serve me at all to even go that direction. So instead I had to reinterpret things for what's good about this and ask better questions. Because right now the way things are out there with the media and people's conversations and what's going on, people are focusing on what's wrong instead of what's right. And there's so much right out there, you may be missing opportunities to be happy, to, to find joy, to find love, to find 
everything that you want because you're focused on what's wrong. And I'm just kind of tired of it. I felt like it was time for a message to give you some new tools. Look at things and go back to what I said from the beginning. Is, is it a generalization, a deletion, a distortion? How is it taken in and what context is it taken in? What state were you in when you actually took the information in? Because that also changes all information. If you're looking for what's wrong, what do you think you'll find? You'll find what's wrong. If you're looking for what's right, you'll find what's right. So I always look at everything as the energy triangle is the energy triangle controls your state. It has everything to do with how you receive information, how you give information, and what you do. And the first part of the energy triangle happens to be your body and how you're holding your body, how you're breathing, how you're, how you're standing, how you're acting, how you're moving, everything to do with your body. The second has to do with the communication, the communication that you have for yourself, that you have with others, for what you're telling yourself. If you're saying that things are hard and bad and people are mean or angry and everything else out there, that's all you're going to find. If you're fine, if you believe Believing that you're telling yourself that the world is good and there's opportunities and there's possibilities, that's what you'll find too. So communication is really important. And the last one is the direction of your energy. Where, where focus goes, energy flows. So you want to make sure your energy is going in the direction that you want to be in. And too often people are spending the energy in what they don't want versus what they do want. So I encourage you to start putting the energy where you want to be. You change this energy triangle. You change one, you change your life. You change one, you make a difference. Change two would be huge. Change three, you change your whole life. And I encourage you to make sure that you use this energy triangle to manage how you're feeling and manage your state in a situation. And before you judge something for what it may not be, ask yourself better questions. Look at the resources. Where is it coming from? And decide, is it true? Don't Let's not be taking everything for face value because we're missing opportunities to really understand what is out there and how to actually receive information in a healthier way. So I hope this was helpful for you. If it was, write a tip that you just took away. Share this with a friend. Let's help start helping more people. The reason why I'm doing this is I actually made a commitment to one of my coaches. I have an SEO coach. Uh, Melanie Gorman, she's amazing. And she said to me, Lisa, I want you to do a Facebook Live every single day for 30 days. And I said, yes. So I'm one for integrity. This is my second day. And if you like what you heard and you think it'll benefit others, share it with somebody. I promise you I'll be giving you some amazing information because I have lots of thoughts and I don't usually put it out there. But now that I committed, boy, you'll be getting a couple of minutes every day of some wisdom from 25 years of research. And thank you, Wendy, um, research and, and understanding who we are and why we do what we do and how to become even more successful personally and professionally. So Thank you for joining me, and I look forward to seeing you again tomorrow. So join me, look for me, share it. Um, let's let's see what we can do with this commitment that I made, and and I encourage you to make a commitment, stand true to it, and hold yourself accountable. Okay, love you. Thank you for joining me. I will see you soon.